You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters Radio, and I'm your Southern Sister. In case you didn't know, you can check us out every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. And I'd love to hear from you. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. Hey, baseball fans. I'm Casey Motter. Welcome to Wins World. My friends, the long-awaited summer supper and sud segment. Easy for me to say. Wow, that's a mouthful. Oh, my gosh. And I, I've been missing the mouthful of scrumptiddly umptious recipes mm. from our southern sister, Janie Earhart. Welcome back to hey, Wins Joey. World. Hey, Joey. Oh, my goodness. It's good to be back. I've missed you. I've missed you, too. But you know what? You haven't missed me as much as you've missed having a good succulent brisket. Mm. That's what we're talking about today. Can I tell you? Oh, I have do. a friend, Hattie Montgomery. She's from Waynesville, North Carolina. She said to me once at an event, she said, give me a succulent brisket any day of the week and call me happy. Oh, That's wow. what she said. Those are words of wisdom. Indeed. I Personally, I think little else satisfies our primal need for beef. And it is a primal need. You know it is. Oh, yeah. Like brisket, especially one that's maybe covered in a, in a wonderful spice-laden rub, oh. right? So I have to tell you, this time of year, I start thinking about uh, slow-roasted beef brisket mm. really any time of the year. I, I, not just summer. But why not summer? It's barbecue right. season, baby. It is. It is. But you know, one of my favorite things to do with my brisket, I, I usually start with about a four pound beef brisket. I trim it up a little bit. I roast it in the oven with about one to two cans of beef broth. Okay. And I use the Southern Sisters Spice Rub. Oh, okay. Let me Spill tell it. you. Oh, this is a, a wonderful balance of chili powder, salt, garlic powder, onion powder, black pepper, a little touch of sugar, because you know we like it sweet in the South, That's right? right? And a little dry mustard. Now, folks, I'm going to have this recipe for the Southern Sisters Spice Rub on the website. Just go to southernsistershome.com, click on the blog, and you'll find it. It shall be yours. It's amazing. And you can, quite frankly, rub this on just about any type of, any cut of meat, not just the brisket. And that's how folks get to know Jenny Earhart is heading to that Mm -hmm. website. There's tons of cool stuff. I got to know you a little bit more by heading to Southern Sisters Home. And I also found some succulent sauce recipes. Oh, my word. Once you pull that gorgeous, slow-roasted beef brisket out of the oven, you gotta, you know, it's nice to slather it with a little sauce. I'm going to take you, Joey, on a magical mystery tour across the South. I'm okay? ready. I'm going to talk to you real quick about the five mother sauces of Southern barbecue. Let's start in Alabama, shall we? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, Alabama is known for a white sauce. Have you heard of such a thing? Okay, this is a unique bar- a barbecue sauce. It is a, ma- a mayonnaise-based sauce, believe it or not. Hmm. Mayonnaise, white vinegar, a little brown mustard, some horseradish and ground pepper. Shake it all up in a mason jar. Amazing drizzled over our beef brisket, oh, okay. as well as smoked chicken. Not bad at all. Now, listen, let's leave Alabama. Let's head on up to North Carolina, okay? It. Now, we're going to go east to west. So, in eastern North Carolina, now, this is a, this is the bare bones sauce, right? This is a no-frills, bare bones barbecue sauce and they North Carolina's uh, particularly the ones in the eastern part of the state refer to this as the only barbecue sauce acceptable right, naturally. right it is basically a lot of vinegar and some red pepper flakes there you go no, easy, no easy. tomato base nice and clear white wine vinegar apple cider vinegar red pepper flakes a good shake of tabasco sauce and you've got yourself an eastern carolina barbecue sauce now the western carolinas they like it a little sweeter 
As kind, they should. Kind of like me. <laughs> now, this is also a vinegar-based sauce, but it's a little thicker and a little sweeter than its East Carolina cousin, right? So you've got in this one some apple cider vinegar, a little ketchup. There comes your tomato, right? Some dark brown sugar, salt, black pepper, and once again, a good shake of red pepper flakes. Make it nice and spicy. Now, if we want to head on down into South Carolina, Let's do did, it. did you even know there were this many sauces across the South? I had no idea until now. Isn't it remarkable? Now, the South Carolina South, for those of you that are from South Carolina, know that the uniquely yellow tang with hints of spice and sweetness is what has established this bar- barbecue sauce as a South Carolina institution. So the base of this is yellow mustard. Brown sugar, white wine vinegar, uh, Worcestershire sauce, a little hot sauce, some kosher salt and pepper. You whisk all that together. Mm. Isn't that amazing? It sounds so tantalizing. You know, it, and quite frankly, any of these delicious sauces would be wonderful on that oven roasted brisket. And if you're thinking about, well, how much of this, how much of that, it's all on the website, southernsistershome.com. You got to head there. There's so much cool stuff to see. And of course, our southern sister, Jenny Earhart, kicks off the Man Cave afternoon right here on The Answer every Saturday at high noon. That's right. Stick with us because our perfect beer pairing from Beer Guy Aaron is coming up right after this. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment, reduce your payments by 30 to 50%, and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Oh, it's beer pairing time, and our southern sister, Jenny Earhart, had a wonderful recipe for brisket, but it doesn't stop there, because as you know, brisket can come with all sorts of different sauces and dry rub, and I thought, no better man to be in Wen's World to give us the perfect pairing than Beer Guy Aaron. What's going on, Joey? How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, and you know what? If someone can cook a brisket, that's impressive, because it's either really too dry or just not done right. If you can do brisket right, let's put it this way. I'll bring the beer, you bring the food. That'll work. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so you talk about different kind of dry rubs out there. Uh, You've got uh, dry rubs, uh, the Memphis style, kind of a tangy, sweet type of sauce. You've also got the Carolina styles, which are a little more vinegar-based. And then the classic uh, old-school KC style, which is very sweet. So there's really kind of three different types of sauces out there or different types of preparation you can do. Now, I'm not a barbecue master, but uh, those are the three three that I know anyway. Sure. Yeah, and uh, you know you kind of want to pair beers differently with whatever sauce or rub that you want to using. So, with the first example, uh, looking at a dry rub that's uh, kind of tangy and sweet, uh, got a little bit of that vinegar flavor on there. Uh, you don't want anything to overpower that, but you also want a little bit to cut it. Right. Yeah. So what we're looking at here locally, uh, Reformation Brewery out of out of uh, Woodstock, they make a Stark Porter, which is not a heavy porter. You know, it's more of a lighter on the lighter side. So you don't want to get a porter or stout that's 
going to just absolutely overpower you. It's huge and boozy and those types of things. But you want something a little bit on the lighter side. So locally, Reformation Stark, it's in a black and white can. You can't miss it with a Reformation logo on it. Um, and, but if you can't find that, of course, an old school Guinness or Murphy's will work as well. So, And Aaron, that first example would be a good compliment to the Alabama white sauce, uh, part of the recipe page on southernsistershome.com, right? That's correct. That'll be good, too. Now, the other one we're talking about is uh, Carolina. Now, Carolina's uh, barbecues are mostly vinegar based. Mm. And uh, what I like to do with that is to have a rye beer with it. Now, rye is part of the malt bill. It's part of what uh, kind of ferments and makes the grain. But when you put rye in a beer, it gives it a little more bite to it. Right. Not necessarily bitterness, but a little bit of a bite. And that's going to be nice to kind of cut that vinegar again. A couple of great uh, ideas, examples of that would be from Creature Comforts out of Athens, reclaimed rye. That's more of an amber rye ale. So if you're not really into the hoppiness of it, and again, you don't want something that's super hoppy and super bitter because that's going to compete with the flavor. Use a reclaimed rye. Again, that's a really nice one as well. One of my favorites, actually, is from Second Self here in Atlanta. It's called Red Hop Rye. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, that is my perfect barbecue drink. That's the that's the beer that I really kind of see myself going to more and more because it's got a little bit of that body. It's got a little bit of that rye bite to it, but it's not overpowering enough where it's just it takes over the entire the entire meal. Right. So, so yeah, that's a good one, too. Um and also, if you're kind of old school, going with a KC, you know, the sauce, the stuff you get at the grocery store, and there's nothing wrong with that. I do love me a good KC barbecue sauce. You don't want to really kind of get too crazy with anything because the sweetness is going to overpower that, but you also don't want to have it too sweet. So you don't want to necessarily have the beer, you kind of cut that sweetness a little bit. So we're looking at more of a German style beer. Mm. And uh, Kolsch is a perfect one. It's a good entry level beer. It's an easy light drinker. Good for hot weather as well. So uh, a couple of uh, ones that you want to look out for from Jekyll up in Alpharetta. They make a Big Creek Kolsch and Eventide from uh, the Grant Park area in Atlanta. They make a Kolsch as well. So a couple of good beers. And again, if you've got someone who's not really into craft beer, those are good ones to pick up as well because pretty much uh, anyone can drink those pretty easily. Right. So we talked about a few of the other barbecue sauces. There's one that's calling my name, and it's a South Carolina mustard sauce. What say you about a beer pairing for this one? Yeah, you know what? I'd actually go right back to that uh, that rye um, as well. Okay, my, cool. I have relatives from South Carolina, and I've had mustard barbecue many a time. It's delicious. It's fantastic on nice. pork. So definitely try that. Um, but yeah, I'd go with, that, with one of those ryes. So the, either the Red Hop rye, Reclaimed rye, or a Reformation, again, makes an Atlas rye IPA. So if you want something a little more kick to it, go with that one. And in case somebody missed uh, Beer Guys Radio early on today. I don't know why you would, but right. okay, I know. I just It's, <laughs> it's terrible. But they can uh, catch it on demand on your website, beerguysradio.com. That's right. Yeah. Also, uh, podcasting on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Just go ahead and search for uh, Beer Guys Radio, and we're there. And the Man Cave Afternoon kicks off every single Saturday on The Answer at noon with Southern Sisters Radio. Guys, recipes to die for. So easy, even the winds can make them. And of course, right after that, Beer Guys Radio with Aaron and Tim at 1 o'clock. Aaron, always a pleasure to have you. Cheers. Cheers. Break! Hey, KLRN Radio family. This is Jenny Earhart. Check out the Southern Sisters Radio Show every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. Connect with me on Facebook at Southern Sisters Home with Jenny Earhart. You can also catch our Facebook Live videos, unedited and uncensored. Connect with me personally. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. This is Dennis Prager, and I am in Wen's World, and I love it. My friends, welcome back to Wen's World. You know, it's not every day that you get to talk to a spy. Yes, my next guest used to be a spy for the Israeli National Intelligence Agency, also known as Mossad. Please welcome Shalva Hassel to Wen's World. Shalva, welcome to the show. How are you? Good afternoon, Atlanta. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'm so excited. I've never been able to talk to a real-life spy, and you have 
quite the story to tell. Of course, uh, people can reach you online, your website, S-H-A-L-V-A-H-E-S-S-E-L, shalvahessel.com. And you are the author of a book based loosely upon your life story, correct? Inside my life story, it's all a true story. It's a thriller, a suspense story uh, about things that happened to me. But it's not a documentary. It's really uh, a story. A mission. You have their love, you have their money, you have their death, you have everything in the book. But it's all uh, a, a, within the book. I talk about what does it mean to live as a family in an enemy uh, line uh, undercover. Right. What does it mean? What does it mean in everyday life? What what it takes from a from a wife to do that? And uh, sometimes you have to think well, whether I had the right to take my kids and, and put them in such situation could have, that could have ended very differently. Right. So let's start at square one. What was it like to be a wife and a mother and living this double life, if you will? And well, listen, on the surface, we live a life like every, the everyday life is like every normal suburban family. Uh, in United States, you get up in the morning, you have your coffee, you go to the gym, you play tennis, you you take your kids to the nursery, your husband go to work. Everything is, is normal except on a small difference. Uh, this is, uh, the, all this is an illusion right. because underneath all this, there is a big secret that if exposed, we are all dead. And uh, you have to remember it all the time, and you have to all the time think, what is your next step? And you have a mission to do, and you have a mission to accomplish. That's why you are there. And you have to expose terror attacks. You have to expose the enemies of the free world, uh, those enemies that want to hurt my country, Israel, or United States, USA, or UK, or the free world. This is, you live a double life. So you always have a stone in your heart. But in one hand, you live a normal life. Uh, It's very difficult to explain. And sometimes you you almost believe it. But then you always have to remember that one small mistake, and it's really, really bad. The the situation can be really bad. So you talk about a mistake, even a simple mistake. What kind of consequences would that cause for you, your family, and even your children? There are many aspects to that. Right. You know, when I wrote the book, A Married to the Mossad, that is now on Amazon, you know, in English, in Amazon, it's bestseller in Israel, and it is now an Amazon bestseller. It was a bestseller. It made me rethink whether I had the rights uh, to do that and to, to put my kids in such situation. We as a parent, is it the right thing I did or not? But, you know, I think today when I see my kids grow up, I see even the benefits and um I think it's only when you rise above your own narrow self-interest is that you find the courage to do and to achieve unbelievable things. And I think uh, uh, my kids uh, today, when I look at them, and we talk about it a lot, they have a lot of competing identities. Mm -hmm. They feel good everywhere, and they can melt in any society, but they never feel at home. This is a price I think they paid. And they, but they are, and they feel different. That's what they tell me. They always feel different uh, because they didn't feel as, as a solid uh, childhood. But they know another thing. They know that it is okay to be afraid, but you have always to be the boss of your fear, and you have always have to control your fears. And no, don't think only of yourself. If you think on others as well, you will do great things, and you will uh, have the blessing. And again, we are with author Shalva Hessel. Check out her new book, Married to the Mossad. Her website, shalvahessel.com, S-H-A-L-V-A-H-E-S-S-E-L.com. This is a book, it's a fictionalized version of her own real-life story. So there's a lot about this book that identifies almost mirror-like to your life, right, Shalva? Well, yes and no. The book talks about what does it mean to live in the Mossad. And when I thought that the biggest things I did in my life is living in an enemy country and risking my children and all what uh, caused it, is when I left and we came back to live a regular life, somehow I was drawn into another mission that I took upon myself alone. And this is a true story. Against very bad guys in Europe, 
and I tried to save some children and some family where the police and nobody can do anything. And I drone into a situation and it almost uh, tore my family. I almost got divorced. They almost uh, they wanted to, to assassinate me. So this is the story. This is the, the, the story, most of the story in the book with all uh, the story of what does it mean to, to, to be in the Mossad and uh, work undercover. Uh, so, so this is when you buy the book, then you get uh, you, you get to read uh, these two combined situations. Now, in that area of the world, the role of the woman is very limited compared to, let's say, the United States. What kind of experiences would you say uh, really shaped you into becoming a fantastic mother, wife, and as far as a spy? Look, I, I really believe in women. I think women don't get what they should get. And I think uh, you cannot fight terror today and you cannot achieve the success without women. Right. Uh, in, in leading women and brave women. It's true that not everyone is suitable for that. You have to have some scratch in your disc or something to be a little bit different. But let's face it, 51% of the world is women. So potentially, 50% of the terrorists can be women. So uh, in the society that is very conservative where those uh, women come from, uh, only women can penetrate the organizations and can understand how they think. And, you know, women, we can improvise better. Sometimes we're even uh, braver, braver. And um, sometimes we look very innocent and very weak, but we are not. It's just an illusion of some men. And uh, I think women can uh, really uh, be a major tool in the fight against terror or fight against the bad guys. And right yes. now, you, you currently reside in Tel Aviv, correct? Yeah, I reside in Tel Aviv, yes. Now, now, tell me a little bit about the life over there, because I know that if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, please, that everybody is required to participate in military service as a citizen of Israel, correct? Right. Right, and so even, and, even the women, correct? Yes, everybody. How do you think that shapes the identity of the citizens of Israel and makes you guys tougher than, say, men and women in America? I tell you, I think the best thing that we have in Israel is the army. Because in the army, when you go at the age of 18 in the army, first of all, you're all equal. A, a, a guy who comes from a very rich family with a guy who comes from a very poor family, they're all together and they are completely equal. Uh, so this is, first of all, a very good listen, a lesson for both sides. And you make friends, friendship that lasts forever. So and if you don't have war, this is the best thing that can happen to you, that you are in the army. Of course, war is bad things, but the experience of an army, it's good. And even for women, you know, when you come to the age of 18, you know you have to do something for other, for your community, for the country. And I think, you know, if you are not good to be in combat, not can not everyone can be a combat soldier. Not can everyone go on a fight, but some people, so they go to computers and can they can go to be a chef or can be a cook or can be even a doctor. Right. So um, I think uh, to know that you have to serve your country and do something else for the community and not for your own interest, it's very healthy for a society, especially today, that everybody is for himself. Now, I want to go back a little bit to your time when you were serving alongside your husband on his secret missions for the Mossad. How many times did you wake up in the middle of the night fearing for your life and for your children's lives? I tell you, every night wow. I didn't sleep. At night I used to sit next to the window. My kids went to sleep. We had a huge house. We had a lot of servants. We lived in a la, -la land. It looked like we live a very, very good life. And all our friends didn't know. And I was sitting next to the window until I see the sunrise. And when I hear Allah Akbar, this was the time when I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I always watched. I was always worried that something can happen. It was very difficult. And it, if you read in the book, because there are many situations that I came across that it almost we were very dangerous or People can uh, be suspicious, and I talk to it a lot about the book, something uh, simple. When people they imagine that you tomorrow have to live as a, a, in Syria, 
under the different name in a foreign society right. and, and your name is different. The school you went to, your parents, your religion is different. We live not as a as Jewish, so we have to know which church, who is your, our priest, who is my aunt, which school I went, where did I grow up, why do I have a slight accent. Uh, this is uh, something that you have to learn, and you mm-hmm. cannot make mistakes, and you have to impro- improvise many times because you cannot learn everything. So uh, can you imagine you as an American can leave somebody else out there? Different identity completely? No. and in, Every day? No. And, and actually, in fact, I'm thinking about what that must have been like for your kids. Now, when you were working with your husband as a spy, working secret missions for Mossad, did your kids have any idea about what their mom was actually doing? And we are up against a hard break, but we're going to pick up right here on Wednesday World Radio with the response to this question and so much more. The conversation gets so in-depth about her life as a spy, the Trump administration. Iran, terrorism, and how our media is viewed over there in Tel Aviv, Israel. Fascinating chat with Shalva Hessel. Check out her website, shalvahessel.com. Her book, Married to the Mossad, available on her website and on Amazon. More Wednesday World when we return. Hey, KLRN Radio family. This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters. Uh, Joey and I were talking great beef brisket and the mother sauces of Southern barbecue today. You want any of these recipes? All you need to do is go to our website. Catch us at southernsistershome.com. You can also connect with us on Facebook at Southern Sisters with Jenny Earhart. I'm in Wen's world and I'm loving it. Hey, y'all, in case you missed it earlier, this is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters. Uh, Joey and I were talking great beef brisket and the mother sauces of Southern barbecue today. You want any of these recipes, all you need to do is go to our website. Catch us at southernsistershome.com. You can also connect with us on Facebook at Southern Sisters with Jenny Earhart. And catch the Southern Sisters radio show every Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on AM 920 The Answer. I'm in Wen's world, and I'm loving it. The Out of Control Atlanta Traffic Watch. I don't even know how to start off a segment. I feel really cool right now. I feel like the the, the AC is hitting me in the right way, Chris. What say so you? I walk in and there's this uh, this manly hunk of flesh sitting behind the control board, master control over there with his well groomed chest hair. Uh, <laughs> So the reason my shirt's off, people, yeah, is because- shirts off. I'm sorry, I should have said that. I guess I, I mean I, I, I'm looking at it and I'm mesmerized, and I'm sorry, I couldn't quite. It's okay, you know. It's okay. Focus. I, I came in today and I'm I'm dripping with sweat. <laughs> As you know, the, the Baconator has no air conditioning. Oh, dude, that's bad. But it's the traffic. It's the extenuating circumstances that surround every single commute around Atlanta. And so a trip that should take no more than 35, 40 minutes ends up taking 57 minutes. Yeah, you look at mileage and you think, oh, that's only 7.8 miles yeah. or 13.6 miles. How long could that take? <laughs> Never ask that question, Never by the way. ask that question, yeah, yeah. Uh, traffic won't be that bad. It's only noon in front. No, it's bad all the freaking time. And I feel awful because I left you waiting and we had an appointment to record at uh, 1230 at the latest. Right? right. I was like, I will be there 100 percent by 1230. So let's rewind. But you provided great updates along the way. And for that, I, th- I applaud you. And by the way, you don't make it a habit of being late like a lot of people do. So there's a difference in you know circumstances that are beyond your control and those that uh, are just you know people that just do that and it was out of control so my day started out of control Chris. out of control just like the traffic watching it Atlanta. indeed we're going to get to that at the tail end but there right. are pressing matters to be discussed right now okay and one of those matters is something this, grinding your gears it's grinding my gears is this notion in doctors offices that an appointment time is just a suggested time. But, hell, if I'm late to the appointment, the thunder rolls and the lightning strikes. Doon, doon, doon. Here I am on time for my, new, for my appointment for a new pediatrician that we're seeing because our old one was just not what we needed. Right. Okay, right. Uh, so we get there. It's great office. People are so friendly. But here it is 30 minutes after our scheduled appointment time, and we're still not being called back. I, I mean, it's absurd. So I get back there and I just want to meet the new doctor. That's all. I just want to shake his hand, look him in the eye and introduce myself and just be like, hey, you know, it's, it's good to meet you. You know, I hope you're not a creep. 
that kind of thing. Right. You want to, you know, right, he's, right, he's yeah. around my son. Like, I want to trust people that are around my son. Of course. And I understand things happen, but 30 minutes, dude, 30 minutes, it's, it's a half hour. I want to know what they do when you're sitting there in the doctor's office and, you know, you got your shirt off, kind of like you right now, and you're sitting on that uh, examination table with a nice crisp white paper that's been pulled over. Oh, and it's always so awkward. It's, it's, <laughs> it's right there, and you're sitting there looking around the room, and, you know, you got the the, uh, the cotton balls and the things and the bandages over there and the hand wash. And, you know, and, every, and the little ear things that I take. Yeah, right. I always take one before I leave because I love the, the feel of it. And the tongue depressors. And and you're thinking, what the hell are they doing, making me wait so long? Right. You know. And then you say, I don't know. It's the. Whole, but you realize that they just like the airlines overbook seats. So if they've got 150 fl- uh, seats on a plane, they book. You know, they sell 155 seats. Right. Um. Under, under the idea, the algorithm that five right, people will inevitably we'll ne- show up late or not at all. Right. And unfortunately, with the doctor's office, yeah, you know, it's it's you're going to have people that don't show up through their appointments. So the problem is, I don't know that I've ever gotten to a doctor appointment. On time. I mean, it's like 30 minutes beyond schedule to me, I think, is a win. But to overbook, people got to get on with their day. I'm already like an hour and a half late to work. Now I have to explain to the eighth floor what's going on. And right. and they get it because they're reasonable people. They ha- they both have kids, but it shouldn't be this way. Like, no. if you're not going to call me back till 1120, my appointment should be at 1120. No, and you know, I, th- I think it goes all the way to the, the the whole medical thing. That's why people hate going to the doctor. I don't think it's the fact that they don't like getting poked and prodded. I mean, nobody really, well, some people do maybe. But, I, you know, look, I don't think it's that. I think it's the kind of elitist attitude that a lot of doctors have. I mean, they, they keep you waiting, and then they don't they don't really, you know, value your time. They're kind of weird birds anyway. I mean, if you're going to spend that amount of time cutting up cadavers to be a, you know. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's face it. You know, you got to be a little off mm-hmm. anyway. You got to have some special... I don't know. Just the whole experience, just you know, the, the the grumpy front staff there, and it always smells like a doctor's office, and you know, the place is just loaded with germs mm-hmm. and ugh. yeah, oh, so. I, yeah. It's just, and I'm sorry, I I don't mean to bring the mood down here in Wentz World, but you guys can relate. You go somewhere, you're supposed to be there at a certain time. You you do your part to be there on time. Then you get there, you're like, all right, so. You know, an hour later at the latest, I'll be out of here and on my way to be a productive citizen. Right, here you in have America. a schedule. You have a you have laid out your day as to what you need to do, and you know you factor in traffic because it's always out of control. But sure. but you would think that you could get in and 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 was this so you had your son with you, right? Uh, we it was it was the wife and and my son and I and we're it was all like an initial there. visit visit, right? Yeah. It was just like a consultation, yeah. like you like know. hey, come in, meet the doctor. Like he had some, he has to get some shots today, so it's okay. It's you know, one of those appointments. But, and you can't act annoyed because these people are taking care of your kid. It's like being annoyed with daycare people. But like, by God, they expect that payment up front. You know, right. that, you know, it's like, like hey, time of service. Uh, Mr. Wenz, a uh, co-payment's due. Please come to the front counter with your insurance. Oh, they don't even let you go card. back now. Oh, you no, know? no, no. I no. mean, it's, you know, so so by God, that money is due. And if you don't have insurance, you're kind of screwed. But yeah, thanks, Obama. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring Barry into this, but it seems very convenient. Everybody got Obama phone. Everybody, that track phone. Unlimited minutes, baby. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I digress. Here yes. we are about seven minutes in. What right. can we anticipate besides a whole lot of sweat this weekend on the Atlanta roadways if you're riding minus AC? Oh, man, don't be riding dirty and I, hot. No, I'm already hot stinky and enough. I don't need anything to get me in a hot he, jail cell in the south here. Ladies and gentlemen, he, does, he has now placed his white shirt back on, and, and it does have some... Rather large pit stains. And they're the yellow ones, so you know I'm wearing oh, yeah. a cheap deodorant. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're sure. You're too young to remember that. Uh, oh, no, I remember, no, remember the shirt that? commercials. Okay, so uh, this weekend, you know, the Express Lane Project continues in Cobb on 75. So most of the weekend, there are going to be detours in the nighttime hours for the ramps that lead to and from 75. So if you're going to be traveling, maybe you're going to be out on a town, maybe drinking some adult beverages, whatever, uh, you know. Uh, and you you go that way, uh, a lot of those ramps are going to be closed, so you won't be able to go from like 285 West to 75 North. It, they'll feed you to Cobb Parkway, and then you'll have to route all the way up and go to Windy Hill and come across and all that. So. Yeah, so the idea is if you're going to drink, don't wait enough so you're legal to drive and sure. it's safe because inevitably you'll miss the, the wrong, you'll miss the turn, and then you'll think, oh, I can take a U-turn here, and then it's no U-turns, but there's no sign indicating such, so you get... Pulled over and, and Smyrna it's Popo don't thing. they don't mess around, dude. Man. That's how they get their money. They, it's a revenue it's it. driver. That's it. So. And so don't be dumb and and fall into the trap of the system. 
be above the system. Like a trap phone. Like a, like a trap phone with your track phone, with your no AC <laughs> hoopty like I have. You know, I, I could have made a million dollars off that rhyme right there. For sale, sure. Santa Fe. <laughs> 2004, Santa Fe. You know, this car has been uber faithful to me so yeah, i'm not uh, dog in the car like dude i mean it's what 13 years old now how yeah, many miles got on it 13 uh coming up on 300k okay i mean you can't ask for i can't a, a original engine and everything original engine only wow. had only a part of the transmission has been replaced and that was before i even bought the car That's, at eighty seven thousand. okay so you haven't touched it then so. no i just right. on synthetic oil changes i hey, take man. care of it you know i do need an, a good. new uh filter though because there, there's a wasp a dead wasp <laughs> <laughs> last time i got an oil change the guy's like yeah you might need a new filter and i was like yeah i'm just gonna go to walmart so i don't get the 200 percent upcharge that i'd get here at the uh at the oil change place. That's a smart thing. But but you know they bring those things out to those those women that go, This hey, you better change this better or, do it right now. Know, or the car's or, gonna die. Or you'll be assaulted before you leave here. <laughs> I mean basically that's what they do. Dude, it's it's kinda highway robbery. It's a scare for, tactic. for like a five dollar filter when they charge you like fifty bucks. Oh, I mean, it's, it's awful. Yeah, it's it's bad. Chris so. Monroe, I love you and thank you so much. This guy is tweeting in his sleep. His thumbs are always active. Follow him on Twitter at Atlanta Traffic and of course the show here at Wins World Radio. Until next time, keep that AC cranked and keep reaching for the stars. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment. Reduce your payments by 30 to 50% and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hey, KLRN Radio family. This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters. Uh, Joey and I were talking great beef brisket and the mother sauces of Southern Barbecue today. You want any of these recipes, all you need to do is go to our website. Catch us at southernsistershome.com. You can also connect with us on Facebook at Southern Sisters with Jenny Earhart. I'm in Wen's World, and I'm loving it. Hi, this is Vinny Bucci, a.k.a. The Booch of the Male Soap Opera Moment. Make sure you check out The Booch Cast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. Also, like the show on Facebook where you can find archived episodes. I'm in Wins World, and I love it. I love me some good old-fashioned wrestling. The Rock actually cares about this ongoing soap opera. This is your male soap opera moment. Look out, folks! The fireworks are all over the place here in Wen's Room. We're going crazy this very weekend. Great balls of fire come to the Wen's World porch, if you will. Here we are. Ducking and diving, juking and jiving, avoiding the smoke and all the sparks that are flying around us with the one, the only, Vincent J. Bucci. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. All those years and of watching those Matrix movies has paid off because I managed to dodge <laughs> every single one of those fireworks. You know what? I give a whole new respect to Keanu Reeves to be able to do stuff like that. I think the Matrix was training for him to do John Wick. Like, I truly believe that. Like, it's it's just amazing. So <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, Keanu learned everything he needed to know on the set of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. You know, <laughs> time zone portals and such in a telephone booth. A lot more talent that takes than to... Uh, duck lightning and avoid thunder i think absolutely and to be able to play an air guitar and make noise with it is even more of a skill (laughs) excellent (laughs) and you know what else is going to be excellent is this weekend great balls of fire on the wwe network which by the way you can have for a mere 9.99 so let's just go down the list here we'll start with the pre-show a match where i can't really understand why this uh this match is on the pre-show of course you have neville taking on akira 
Tazawa. Tazawa. I got yes. that right for once. Yes, you did. You Excellent. got it. Excellent. Excellent. Where is my bell of life? I here? was just about to ring it. I don't know here where the bell. Let me find it. Sorry, uh, we are, we're a little bit disheveled today. And- in Winsboro. There it is. The Bell yeah. of Life has, has spoken here. A championship match should never, ever, ever be on a pre-show. I agree with that. I've always found that annoying. They did the same thing like when, when Gallus and Anderson won the tag belts. They put that on the pre-show. I'm like, why are they doing that? Most people go, so people who watch the pre-show. No, that, it takes away the meaning of the match. So there's a good chance Neville is probably going to win this now because it's on the pre-show. Because if Akira Tozawa wins... Yeah, it'll look great on Raw, but then it'll ruin the moment for the pay-per-view, especially with Titus O'Neil promoting this as much as he's been doing. Right. So this is op- it's an opportunity not only to showcase the Cruiserweight division, but also the Titus brands involved. So that makes it even bigger moment. So to put that on the pre-show is a waste. Indeed. And I forgot to mention uh, Raggy the Robot in studio. Raggy, thank you so much for being with us. We're going to do some predictions, if that's okay. Uh, what am I saying? Well, you're just going to give us uh, you know, your predictions along the way. We're going to go starting with this Neville and Akira Tozawa match. You know, Neville, the king of the cruiserweights, I guess you could say he thinks he's the best in the world. That is not even true. He will never be the best. All right. Well, we'll, we'll have to see after this Sunday. I think it's safe to say that she's taking Akira Tozawa at this point. Uh, yeah, she's definitely taking Akira Tozawa. This is a tough one for me. I want Akira Tozawa to win this match, but I'm pretty sure if, if this is on the pre-show... I think Neville's going to take it. No. Oh, well, okay, there you right. go. You can disagree all you want. No. I'm telling you how it is. It okay? Fine. She wants to want to be that way. So, sometimes she gets a little, you know, out of hand. <gasps> yeah. oh, too much. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll move on here. I, I'm going to take. I'm going to take Neville. No. Uh, let's let's go from that to one of the headlining match here. Uh, Brock Lesnar taking on Samoa Joe for the WWE Universal Championship. Booch, what say you? Wow, this is probably the toughest match to predict for the one reason of how they have built this storyline up. Mm. They have, regardless of what happens at Great Balls of Fire, they have they have built the credibility of Samoa Joe. Yes. So I don't see him taking a hit, but at the same time, I don't think Brock is going to. If Brock is going to lose the title, it's not going to be on a Raw pay per view. So I say that because because of the way I see storylines going, I think Brock Lesnar is going to find a way to win. But I can one thing I will predict: this will not be Suplex City one two three. This is going to be a fight, a real fight. I think it'll go on much longer than the matches he's had with Goldberg, most definitely. But I think in the end, somehow, Brock's going to find a way to win. So I think the Beast is going to take it. Rags to Riches Raggy, do you agree with Booch's assessment? No. All right. Well, I guess she takes Samoa Joe, and so shall the wins here in Wins World. I think the title changes hands, throwing a 180, a wrench into the cog of the WWE wheel. Samoa Joe will become the new Universal Champion after Sunday night. Roman Reigns taking on Braun Strowman in an ambulance match and boy oh boy have they built this up. Oh this is great. This is I, I, this is the match that we should have saw at Extreme Rules but obviously injuries prevented that so now we're going to see it at Great Balls of Fire. This is going to be great. Um, I, I got a feeling Braun's going to win this one. My only complaint with this match is I want it to be a number one contenders match so that when Braun wins he faces... Uh, Les- Lesnar or Joe at SummerSlam because I- I'm not happy with the fact that Roman's getting a title shot. I don't want them pulling the trigger on Lesnar and Reigns this early. So, right. Uh, that's but but aside from that, Braun I think is going to take this. So you got Braun. I got Braun. Um, I got Braun. I mean, that's a lie, and I'm over it. <laughs> well, I don't know what was untrue about that, but I, I suppose you're taking Roman Reigns. She's a big Roman Reigns fan, so yes, uh, Woman Reigns, their favorite wrestler. And, if you know, and, and by the way, uh, folks, if you're wondering why the timing is off with, with Raggy the Robot, it, all robots are created by men, and men are flawed, so therefore robots will inevitably show their flaws. Absolutely. Uh, so there it is there. We just need to program more responses yeah. uh, through this artificial intelligence that is in Wen's world right yes. here. Until the day the creation decides to kill its creator. <laughs> Because I'm pretty sure she's going to kill us. <laughs> That's why there's locks on the door here. Uh, let's let's move it on. Let's, let's switch genders here. Uh, let's take it from the bulge to the no bulge as Alexa Bliss takes on Sasha Banks for the Raw Women's Championship here. What say you, Booch? Uh, this is another tough one because the way they, they again, that's again, the build up to this pay per view has been fantastic because they're creating doubt for me mm. and for everybody else. Mm-hmm. But there's a part of me that thinks. Oh, this is going to be a tough one. I uh, have to go with, I think, 
I think Alexa's going to win. I, I don't see. I, I mean, they've been they've been doing a good job with Sasha, but I don't think they're going to have Alexa drop the belt. I think she's going to wait till SummerSlam, and then we'll finally see the girl we've been wanting to see, Nia, eventually go for the belt. So I think it's going to be. I think Alexa Bliss is going to take it. I think I understand what you're saying here because the last few weeks they've really pushed Sasha Banks to the forefront. That big win over Nia Jax after my my tantrum last week here in Wins World. And then this last week on Raw, which we'll get to in the on-demand version on SoundCloud. But I agree. I think Alexa Bliss retains and we're going to see this feud probably develop into a triple threat match later on down the line. I don't think it's Sasha's time to be champion. Although, I've been wrong at least 10 times today, so <laughs> there's uh, there's a good, distinct possibility that Sasha Banks is our new women's champion and becomes four-time women's champion for WWE. Yeah, I think it could definitely happen. I think if it does happen, if Sasha does win this Sunday at Great Balls of Fire, then I think that's when um, we're going to see her and Bailey lock up at SummerSlam. Mm. So I, I think it's going to be either Bliss and Nia or it's going to be Sasha and Bailey. But I think Bliss is going to take it. Um, this next match, I really have very little interest in. And I think it's because of the sideshow between Seth Rollins and Kurt Hawkins as of late. Yeah. I don't understand. I get they're trying to, to bump up Kurt Hawkins. But to take a creme de la creme superstar in Seth Rollins and using him to do that when he should be in the forefront of the universal title chase is befuddling to me, and I don't think it makes a lot of sense. What say you about his upcoming match against Bray Wyatt at Great Balls of Fire? I think it's going to be great. Uh, I really? Think, well, here's the thing. I think what Seth, the, the new with Kurt Hawkins is, they're letting Seth, um, I think he's trying to get his, ever since he beat Triple H, they have taken the pedigree away as his finisher. So he's had to establish a new one. It's, I think it's that knee to the face thing he's yeah, doing now. Yeah. I think they were using Kurt Hawkins to get that finisher over to establish. To, they're trying to teach the audience that this is my new finisher. And when I hit this finisher, I win. That way it can create opportunities for the fans to think the finish is over. If you're going to have a false finish or something like that. So I think what they're doing. Okay. While at the same time, they're letting Bray do what he does best, which is on the mic. Probably one of the best promo guys in WWE today. To build this matchup, and I, while I'm I'm struggling to find out who's going to win this, I, I think it's going to be Bray. I think they're really starting to take Bray Wyatt seriously now. Ever since the House of Horrors, when they had him go over on Orton, I sure. think that was him coming to Monday Night Raw and trying to reinvent him in a way, yeah. or not really reinvent, but like get him on a build up some more momentum and get him off the SmackDown brand. And that's why they had him drop the title to bring him to Raw because they want to keep the title there on SmackDown. So I think that he's going to get this victory over Seth and it's going to propel him a little bit further. So I think Bray's going to take it. Solid analysis again. But that kind of insight is is brilliant. And I didn't take that into consideration. The Kurt Hawkins and the finisher to solidify a new move. The one problem I have when you're using somebody as unknown as Hawkins is that a signature move, not a finisher, could finish him off. Yeah. Right? So I get what you're saying, and I hope that you're right. I do have my doubts uh, about this match. I'm going to disagree because I think Seth Rollins is going to be put back in the forefront, and we're going to see Wyatt feud probably in the near future with John Cena as he back, uh, bounces back and forth between Raw and SmackDown. Yeah. Um, Sham, so what do you think about this match coming up? I gotta go. I'm so hungry. Is it lunchtime? I, well, we gotta go, too. We're up against it. We'll be back with the on-demand version. Check it out, SoundCloud.com, up in the search bar. Wens World, W-E-N-Z, World. Till next time, have a nice day. Bang, bang. This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters Radio, and I'm your Southern Sister. Connect with me personally. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. I'm in Wen's World, and I'm loving it. Wen's World is fantastic. This is Wen's World. It's weird science time. What if our universe was just a hologram? And I thought, because I'm not smart enough to understand all the intricacies of this question, that I would bring in a true genius, an astrophysicist from our good friends out there in Cali, Reasons to Believe's own Dr. Jeff Swearing. Welcome back to Wen's World, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Joey. I'm doing well. And I'll, I'll take the uh, title of uh, astrophysicist. I think genius may be pushing it there. So. Uh, I don't know, man. You, have, <laughs> you seem to have all the answers. So this question here boggles my mind. I can't even get past the notion of what I'm seeing, feeling, what I'm hearing, what I'm smelling isn't what they call real. Help me unpack this. 
Well, this is uh, one of these odd things that happens in physics is that we, you know, as, as uh, physicists are trying to understand a certain phenomena, they'll do some weird mathematical stuff that looks almost kind of like mathematical hocus pocus, but nonetheless, it turns out to work and be very practical. And, and this is one of these uh, things. That it, it actually relates from a long-standing argument about whether information is destroyed in a black hole. And you know, for physicists, there's a real reason why they think that's a problem or not. But there was this argument between Kip Thorne and Stephen Hawking and Roger Preskill, and you know, it was a, it was a fairly vocal but friendly war out at, about this. Um, but all that to get around to, they're trying to understand what happens to uh, what, what's going on inside a black hole. And they came up with this very remarkable principle that all of the information inside a black hole could be encoded on the surface around it. And so they've got this three-dimensional structure that all of the information in that three-dimensional structure can be encoded on the two-dimensional surface of it. And so people begin thinking, well, what if we could apply that principle to the universe? And so, uh, you know, because it's, it's a general principle, not just specifically to black holes, but they were asking the question, what if our, all of the three-dimensional stuff we see in our universe is really just the information that's encoded on a two-dimensional surface? And that, that's they called it the holographic principle because that's really what you're doing with a hologram is you're taking a two-dimensional surface, you're encoding all of this information, and then when you look at it with a particular system, you get all of the three-dimensional structure behind it. And so that's kind of the, the general principle or what the thought is behind this and why it's called the holographic principle and why we think you know, people are talking about our universe might be a hologram. So what do you make of it? Are you seeing their side of things, or are th these kind of super outlandish claims in your opinion? Well, I, I think they're in the order, in the class of scientific speculation. And I don't mean where people are just throwing out weird things and get away with anything. <laughs> right. They're trying to put forth ideas that would help us understand how our universe actually works. And the, the speculative part is that we don't have the tools to yet test them, and so they're trying on the ideas and fleshing them out and seeing could we test them and could we get evidence for and against. And, and there are some areas where we get in, or where these explanations provide a better match to the data than some other explanations. But all that being said is they are still very speculative. They could be completely wrong. Uh, we just really don't have the tools to test them yet. So how do we view time in light of this theory? Um, th I think that, that's a good question that I don't have a great answer for because this is, it probes in a little bit beyond my expertise or what I've specifically studied. But my vision of that is that you know, you've got this uh, two-dimensional surface that is projecting all the three-dimensional spatial information that is kind of evolving through time. And so... Uh, you know, time still really does kind of behave as we think it does. Right. Uh, but there, even in this, even in these ideas, there are connections between past or some of the uh, some of the solutions for this, if you will, have uh, scenarios where past, present, and future are all connected and correlated in certain ways. And so, time would actually uh, be involved there. And you know, the other thing you have to realize is that we're not just taking a three-dimensional, the three spatial dimensions and casting it onto a two-dimensional surface. It's whatever the dimensionality of our universe is, we're putting it on a, a universe that has one less dimensions to it. So, you know, in, in that time would be either included in the fact that all of this evolves through time or that that would be part of that projection in there as well. So, like I said, it gets into the, to the details and gets kind of complicated after a while where, the, the, the difficulty in this is at some level you just have to trust that what the math says is, is an accurate picture of what's going on. And that's what we're having. That's what we can't actually test yet is what is, is what we're getting from the math is that actually correspond to reality. That's difficult to test, right. to test so, at this point. So with the correlation between past, present, and future, does this theory a lot for time travel or? No, it, it still would not allow any sort of time travel. Okay. Again, it's, it's really just trying to get at the fundamental reality of what is it that is the reality of our universe. And 
you know, when you get into quantum mechanics, that sort of question comes up. And even in general relativity and black holes, you're trying to get into what's the ultimate reality of things. And one of the things science has shown us is that our reality or the ultimate reality is often very counterintuitive. You know, we think of things, time moves at a specific fashion, space is absolute in the way we think about it, Mm -hmm. that things are entirely deterministic. And when you look at general relativity and quantum mechanics, what they show you is that those seemingly common sense ideas don't provide a good description of reality. And so this is really just kind of going along in that vein that it may just be something that's kind of weird that we have to get used to. Now, how do you view all this through the spiritual lens? Well, uh, you know, I mean, if you take the analogy of a hologram there, you may say, all right, there's this two-dimensional surface that you can get this three-dimensional structure out of. But ultimately, to do that, you have to have a an entity that transcends that two-dimensional structure, if you will. So there's often a laser that you shine through, and it projects things, or you have to be looking at it from a different dimension. And so it really does kind of have this idea that there's something beyond the hologram, if you will. Right. And I find that very comfortable with what Christianity has to say, that there's a, a God who transcends creation and who, and who uh, can see things outside of creation. So I find that, that idea fits very well within my, my spiritual view of the world. And one of the other things that I find interesting is that um, we are limited in our ability to understand what the fundamental reality is. You know, again, if Christianity is true, we're very much physical and spiritual beings who exist, but our eternal state or our eternal nature is not really tied to this universe. This is a temporary universe, if, you, if, if Christianity is correct description of things. And so the fact that it's got some ambiguity, or not ambiguity, but some weird aspects where it's a projection of a, of a, of a lower dimensional plane, that really doesn't bother me either, because in some sense, how do you have eternal beings who exist in a finite physical universe? Well, there's going to have to be some weird stuff going on there for that to work properly. So I, I don't know how that's all going to play out, but I don't see anything in here that says, oh, yeah, clearly Christianity's got a wrong description of things. Right. And as linear creatures, it's almost impossible when my brain starts thinking about creation and the end. It's like, OK, so God was here before all of us. But you know, when did God arrive or how did he arrive and all these things. And I just come to this place where I just don't get it. Right. So I I think that's where a lot of us lose track of just the linear structure of time and how it all plays out as human beings. No, I think you're right. And, you know, one of the things I know as a physicist is that, you know, I say, okay, how do I explain that? Okay. I get that. I understand that. And then there are certain things that after a while, I can't say I understand them, but I get, comfortable with them, and because that's just the way things are. And I think that applies in the spiritual realm as well. There's aspects of how God interacts with us that we can understand, and then there's just a point to where you say, that's just the way God is, and you, you kind of get used to it, if you will. So, I, I mean, I don't know what a trillion means. There's nothing that I have a trillion of that I could sit down and delineate, but after a while, you get to those big numbers, and I get comfortable with them because I use them enough, but I don't entirely understand them. And so I kind of see a, a parallel with the, you know, what you're talking about and how God interacts with things, is that God transcends time, He created time, but yet I'm a very timeful being, and everybody's a very timeful being. So at some level, I'm just going to have to be comfortable with that. Man, that's such great insight from Wen's World's personal astrophysicist, Dr. Jeff Swearing. You can connect with Dr. Zwerink on Twitter at RTB underscore J-Z-W-E-E-R-I-N-K. Of course, connect with Reasons to Believe out there in California on Twitter at RTB underscore official. Hit them up online, reasons.org. Dr. Zwerink, in addition to being an astrophysicist, you're also the author of Who's Afraid of the Multiverse and co-author of the Impact Event Series. After listening to you talk about all of this, I've gone cross-eyed, but I do feel like I have somewhat of a better understanding of what these scientists are talking about and how it relates to our everyday lives uh, and even toward the fun stuff, a.k.a. the abstract. Well, good. I'm glad it's helpful. And, you know, I, I find doing stuff like this interesting because it forces me to dig in and stretch my mind, too. So I enjoy if I can be able to help get a little bit better insight into what's going on. Uh, thanks, Dr. Zwerink. You rock, man. Can't wait to talk next time. Thanks. Looking forward to it, Joey. 
This is Jenny Earhart with Southern Sisters Radio, and I'm your Southern Sister. In case you didn't know, you can check us out every Sunday at 2 p.m. right here on KLRN. And I'd love to hear from you. Email me at radio at southernsistershome.com. What's going on, KLRN Radio family? This is your friend, Joey Wenzler, a.k.a. The Wenz. Follow the show on Twitter at Wenz World Radio, W-E-N-Z. World Radio. It's always great to share this time with you every single Tuesday here on KLRN at 8 p.m., but also on demand. Check us out on SoundCloud up in the SoundCloud search bar, Wen's World. And do visit my friend Janie Earhart's website, southernsistershome.com. Lots of cool recipes, all so easy that even I can do it. And I am a novice at best in the kitchen. So until next week, y'all have a great time and take care.